Howdy. Welcome to another week of Cannon Calls. I'm your host, Jake McAtee. This week, we have the pleasure of having recurring guest Dr. Rod Story on to give us a COVID-19 update and all of the miserable mask business. Dr. Story visited the podcast at the beginning of this pandemic, and I thought it was about time for an update. But before we get started, I wanted to make sure you knew that Canon Press just published G.K. Chesterton's Orthodoxy. Our edition has a fresh and robustly Protestant introduction from best-selling author N.D. Wilson. If you're thinking to yourself, I already have this classic, well, give your copy away to someone in need. You've got to get over this, because our cover has Chesterton with his hair on fire. Get the best orthodoxy cover and introduction in the publishing business today at canonpress.com. All right, now welcoming on special guest, Dr. Rod Story. Thanks for coming back. Hey, glad to be here. Thanks. So you helped a ton of people, and I thought, I feel like we're maybe halfway through the year. We should have a good, like, halftime speech from our favorite doctor. So. Sounds good. I think this is a more like a pep talk when you're on the losing side. <laughs> and you're, uh, you're patting the boys on the shoulder, and then you're saying, uh, hey, get back in there. Love it. Okay. So can you help us timeline-wise? Like, what has happened since we last talked? Absolutely. So uh, I think we were, as we were last talking, things were on our doorstep and there was plenty of rumors going around. Everyone wondered whether the Chinese were telling the truth. And uh, now since we've, in most of the United States, experienced uh, significant amounts of illness and have a track record now to, to kind of describe what maybe looks ahead for the United States. Totally. So we've gotten clarity on that side. Uh, things are starting to open back up. I thought it'd be a great time to have you in because just as things are feel like they're getting in the swing of opening back up, headlines everywhere you turn, coronaviruses are coming back up. So everybody's kind of swinging it back a little bit to closing down. How should we think through that? Well, I think it's interesting to ask, what are we basing our understanding on? And then where are those numbers coming from? And then uh, what is our information or our personal experience of this illness? Where does that come from? Where do, how do we apply it to ourselves personally? There was some interesting information that, that was distilled down by our, our local uh, statistics uh, people, MZ, considering whether this may be related to density of people and underlying illness and age and, and just how bad that is. And I think that still generally holds true. But here we are now seeing it in places that hadn't seen a first wave, uh, including our own Moscow, Idaho. Yeah. So uh, there was a lot of talk about second wave will hit with flu season. Has second wave come early? Well, this is actually a first wave. And what is, what is really unique about this illness is uh, just how much money has been thrown at it. And along with money is actually coming American ingenuity uh, and enterprise, which allows us now to have testing, which is actually quite good, to verify that this is not just run-of-the-mill coronavirus family, like many of the common colds, but specifically COVID-19. And also to look at are people developing antibodies? Are people having this illness that maybe knew, never knew they were going to have it? Uh, there was a question going around in our community, was an illness that we had go through that caused a lingering chest cold in January, February, was that coronavirus uh, of the COVID-19? And I think definitively we can say it was not. That was, I feel like not, Def, I heard it in this community, but I feel like there are lots of people I would hear that. It was. And, 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 we, and what's fascinating is I think we have a heightened awareness of viruses in a way that most of us had, would have just said, oh, yeah, it's the usual chest flu that goes through in the winter. But now we want to give it a name. And now we'd like to know what does it mean? Are we, are we contagious? I think we've just become aware that, what do you know, humans carry viruses and we pass them to each other. So, okay, so now when I'm on social media throughout the day and I see another, uh, we'll just keep it local for, for the sake of conversation. So when Moscow Pullman Daily News says 18 new cases, is this something that I should think should be expected? Or is this something that I should be alarmed by? See that when I see that number go up, I think something's gone wrong that needs to be fixed. Well, I think it's interesting to ask, what is the experience? And here we are. Um, many millions, in fact, probably well over several hundred millions 
of people having experienced this illness worldwide. Uh, we have, uh, like I said, more interest in knowing this illness than most chest flus that go through most viral illnesses. And so we, we've tracked this one like no other. Um, we're, we're trying to uh, track people's connections, and, and now we're using all sorts of rather invasive technology to do that. But what I think is really unique is that we can, we can actually say who, who has had it uh, by testing those antibodies. We can also test people quite amazingly and get results within even a few hours to definitively say with testing in almost every lab, including our tiny little hospitals, that they are having it now. And then we can uh, track what those people's experience is. What I, I think there's two salient, uh, very large articles that have come out recently in, in medical news that I don't think they've gotten the press that they should, but I think that they're actually quite apparent to what is the real experience. The first uh, was the, uh, uh, there's something called a morbidity and mortality report that is put out by the CDC, put out about every other week. Uh, it's one of those uh, uh, governmental reports that puts most people to sleep, but it really gives people a sense of what's going on. And what was fascinating in that report is that it said that most of the new cases that are occurring in people that are COVID-19 specific and positive have no previous connection or known connection to, a, to another illness, meaning that person has no idea where they picked that up. That's a fascinating problem. And, and, and there seems to be a real urge to track people down and quarantine them and, and you know, figure out which cousin gave it to which cousin gave it to which person in the church pew. And then, and then of course, bring some, some, maybe some societal pressure that naughty for you. But the reality is that, that this illness is incredibly um, contagious, and most people have no idea where they came from. What the uh, mid uh, morbidity mortality report really called that was community spread, and it's widespread. And this illness moves basically like most chest illnesses in the winter months, it just spreads from person to person, and, and most who would never even suspect that they were terribly ill maybe just felt tired or a little run down or, or otherwise. So that was one report that came out. And I think it really speaks to a, what I think is, a, is a, maybe a, a foolishness that we're going after where we think that we can, we can identify individuals and uh, maybe even shame them into certain behaviors for having caught an illness that, that, that really is ubiquitous in our society. The second, I think is, is again, a, a further reports confirming what has already been kind of established through some small communities. And that is that, that there are, uh, the experience of a community of this illness is way beyond uh, what, what the, the number of, let me put it another way. The number of people that, that show up ill and know they're ill is a, an incredibly small portion of the total number of people who experience this illness. When you yeah. say that, I've, is it when the media says, like, this person's showing no symptoms, but they have it? Correct. And, so and we know that. And so they've gone through and they've tested some pretty amazing circumstances. A uh, cruise ship, is for one, or, the, or the, I think it was the USS Enterprise, one of those big tips. And what they were able to really ascertain is that uh, there's the prevalence of this illness is 50 times the actual experience of it. So you got the people who show up in the emergency room and say, man, I feel sick. And then they get tested, and they're shown to be positive. And then everyone says, oh, where did you get that from? And, of course, they don't know. Um, but the reality is if you go back and then you test communities who experience this widespread illness, most people never knew, and, and they, as communities, are actually moving on. I think that's actually very hopeful. So you, you asked me a question, second wave. What I think is going to be the experience of this virus is that we will see it go through communities in ways that that is well beyond anybody's understanding, so widespread that the, the few cases we see really are only a small representation, and that no matter the measures taken, it spreads well beyond um, what people think it, they're, they're doing to protect themselves. So one thing I remember, folks, in, in reference to first wave and second wave and the rest, is that it was uh, dependent on the weather. It's It's... We're not, you know, like other places, we're not Texas or Phoenix or anything like that, but it's definitely getting warmer. We've got 80 degree weather here. Uh, is this thing just uh, <laughs> indefatigable? Is this, you well, know, me, an undefeated Let me answer COVID? that in, a, in an interesting way. So, there, you know, the protest movements, uh, the Black Lives Matter, uh, <laughs> yeah. all those marchers that, what do you know, many of them weren't wearing masks, and then there was some public shaming, and the next week they put the masks on. 
why didn't we see a giant amount of spread from that? Because that actually hasn't been a, a giant bump in those areas. What's interesting is this, is, this illness is really, uh, once it gets into outdoors, into beautiful spring places, um, it, it dissipates quickly. What that, what that really means is this virus is frankly like every other virus we know. Meaning, if you're breathing, uh, it doesn't seem to pass terribly amount. If you have very few symptoms, it doesn't seem to have enough viral load in you to pass much to others. So that asymptomatic carrier is, is, is kind of a bogus thought. What really is passing around is people who are getting sick and maybe don't quite realize it yet. They're feeling a little fluish or a little run down or a little tired. And that can be a 12 to 36 hour lead up before they go, oh, I am sick. Those people are carrying a huge amount of virus and spreading it, um, coughing, maybe a little sneeze, maybe, uh, maybe wiping their hands on their nose and wiping it on other people. Um, and that's when the spread comes. But the vast majority of us being in the outdoors. So, so I think that's fascinating because the, the human behavior and, the, and the, uh, the community response to this is everybody wear a mask and would you wear it if, everywhere? Uh, and, and I see people uh, now who are walking hand in hand and they're wearing their masks, uh, you know, <laughs> and, and, or you have uh, the boyfriends wearing a mask and the girlfriends not and, and the dogs wearing a mask. It, it's this weird mix of, of uh, kind of unbelievable behavior that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Or you have the guy jogging in the woods passing out because he's wearing a mask. Um, about the only thing he's at risk of is a face plant and a mosquito bite. Uh, and, and that's the challenge of this is it, people are taking masks to extremes and applying them dutifully, dutifully uh, and just kind of bizarre behaviors. So Moscow just got an emergency order for masks, mm -hmm. at least till Monday. Um, early on, CDC said masks are really not all that helpful. That's kind of come back. That's obviously been repealed. Is there anything to that? Is this, I mean, is, should we be thinking... Well, if nothing else, it's a kindness to others. Let's just how, how do we how do we think about masks? Are these effective tools? That's an interesting question. I think it actually comes down to what your purpose is with the mask, or even stepping back further, what do you think is reasonable and possible when it comes to an illness that is so pervasive and so contagious, and for whom the mask uh, the, the 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 most experience the the usual experience is going to be very little illness. And when you're talking about, again, that, that the, the people that are spreading this are really people who are, who are becoming actively sick, who, who, are, who are spewing it. They're the ones that are carrying a large amount of virus, and they're not paying attention to it. And then let's take a step back further, because I, I haven't quite answered that question. It really comes down to, what is your purpose with this illness? Do you have a mindset that, that all illness should be avoided at all cost? Or do you have a perspective that, hey, illnesses happen, and for the vast majority of people, this is not going to hurt them in a way that's going to be long-lasting, and that it would actually maybe be helpful if they got the illness? If you ask me, and obviously that you are asking me, because I'm sitting across and you're let's nodding make, your head. Let's make the headlines. I, 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 <laughs> I, I would tell you that mask wearing is, is, um, is unfortunate, because I think that, that there are individuals that we should encourage to wear masks. And I would say those are a couple. They're the high-risk people who absolutely have to go out because I, actually this, the masks are not protecting you quite as well as you'd hope. If you absolutely have to go out and you're a high-risk person, um, then please wear a mask and wear the right mask, the, the N95s, and, and don't have the ones that have a nice little porthole on them that are not, not doing a very nice job for you. Or if you're working with those individuals and you're just like trying to be mindful to not pass those things around, you're working in a nursing home, you have to help things keep going. You're part of the machinery of making healthcare work. Wear a mask. I mean, we're trying to, to protect those, those most vulnerable individuals. But on the, on the other side, what we're really doing is prolonging the pain for most people by preventing us from building herd immunity. When we know, and again, we know from uh, hundreds of millions of cases now, that the vast majority of us will have very minimal symptoms at all, or if we do get sick, we'll get through this and weather this. Uh, we know that the people who do poorly with this are aged, have lung conditions, have autoimmune diseases, have heart conditions that are active, uh, and the rest of us, 
we're doing fine. But I would tell you, uh, that's my perspective, and I don't think it's a shared perspective. In fact, it's, um, I, I've been in continued uh, uh, many different medical circles where it's not the reigning paradigm. The reigning paradigm is no one should get sick ever. And I don't know where that came from or why we arrived at that, but that is, I think, actually coming from the people. The people are asking for it. The people have developed fear. And then they, they look to physicians to say, How, what, what can I do? What possibly could I do to, to avoid all this? Well, then it comes down to, well, maybe a mask will help you and then stay away from people and uh, avoid going to work and uh, avoid doing anything outside. And I mean, it just gets endless. And, and, and I think that's the way that often fear works. Fear opens the doors to uh, obscure and, and it opens the doors to, to legal aspects uh, where our politicians give us what we want, which is give us something that we can hang on to, and then we will respond in kind and say, thank you, thank you for taking care of us. And again, the reigning paradigm, I think, is let, let's avoid all illness altogether. Is that reasonable? We, this is a virus, this is a virus that, that we've given a name to and we've tracked with great intensity and we've all paid attention to on our phones with, with uh, notifications every five minutes. But the reality is that that um, it's actually not all that different than our previous experiences of significant viruses that run through the population and the culture and surprisingly don't seem to slow down for anything that we do. As we go into the heart of summer here, should we expect that number to subside at all? The number is going up because we're testing and we're testing and we're testing and we're testing. And we have those tests available, and it is spread so widely that, of course, there's more people that have those numbers. What is interesting, uh, again, is looking at what is the experience. I, I have some friends who track things, and we have several states that are close, well, that are def- definitely farther along than Idaho, which is newly experiencing this. And what they're showing is a rapidly declining, mor- declining mortality rate in spite of a rapidly increasing COVID rate. That's fascinating. So all that put that put that in plain numbers many many people having the illness and many many less than were initially thought dying of this in fact um, less and less by the day we're learning how to treat this well Uh, the treatment is i've never seen an illness that was so quickly uh, worked on thought through information shared in fact i have patients sharing with me information almost as soon as it comes off the presses And, and i think that's fascinating how as a culture we're we're really locked into how can we treat this is that good? Do you think that's positive for us to be? I think that is positive, but I, I think it, it still remains to be seen. Will we do a postmortem on this? Will we go back and say, was that worth it? Were the things that we did effective? And if they were effective, uh, then I think it's worth kind of considering. But was it worth the trade-offs of it? I'll give you one example. I, I think that we have, we have traded a sense of safety for a sense of shared community. Um, in our community, we have, done a, we have a unique situation where we have a medical school. And in that medical school, we've got students here from all over. One of the very first things that happened in our community was that medical students were told, uh, we need to keep you away from patients. We need to, because you might carry the illness to other people, so we're, we're just gonna pull your education. And a lot of those medical students idled for the, have been idling since January. That's a very interesting thing or an interesting way to, tr- to train the next generation of physicians who are going to be needing to assume some risk, to be uh, able to care for people in duress who will be contagious with things that will put physicians at risk. Uh, we have now told those students that there is a period of time where they are uh, non-essential. And also we've told them that that there are times where they, their own personal safety is at higher value than the patients they're caring for. We've also removed from them opportunities for them to learn through those experiences. I, I think that that's a, that's a very, it, was that a wise thing for us to do? Uh, if we're thinking that fear is the reigning paradigm, then great, we've taught that well. I'll give you another example. I think putting masks on people uh, is creating in us uh, an experience that people are uh, virus carriers, that people are to be feared. And I think this will linger with us for some time. Uh, and, it, and it is an interesting question. We've, we've been doing it in our community long, 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 having people wearing masks and, and shying away and, and avoiding all social circles and, 
and uh, did it do us much good? I'm not certain it actually kept the illness from our community. Now that it's here, if, you, if your idea is not to get ill, these are certainly considerations for how to keep it from spreading quickly through a community, but it is going to make it a slow, long process. Is that worth the pain and the increasing anxiety? And then overall, just a, a sense that we look at each other in the eye and can't see each other's smiles, can't read each other's lips, can't even know uh, whether each other are safe to be around. Those that are choosing that, choosing to continue as though we are human and we need touch, we need to be around each other, um, are actually being shamed. And that's a fascinating thing that we're developing as a, as a worldview that now needs to be, needs to be addressed. Uh, because as Christians, we, we believe that we're made in the image of God, image, as image bearers, it's our face. Uh, you know, as you read through scripture, we're, we're, you're talking about the face of God that we're, that we're to mirror and reflect. Uh, and now we're, we're, we're veiling that. That carries some theological issues, doesn't it? Uh, they go quite deep um, as to what is, what is mankind and how are we to interact and how are we to see each other? And then ultimately, how are we to, to view uh, illness and death, which um, as Christians, we've, we've, we've soaked up a lot of our culture without any awareness that, that we will someday meet our maker. I, I have nothing to add to that. What would you say, uh, just as we... Go out. If you had one thing as people turn the podcast off, you have the floor. You know, Moses, who veiled his face because people looked at him and they said, uh, we, we just can't, we can't reflect this, 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 this reflection that you bring from being with God and from and looking intently into the law as he carried it down the mountain. And they asked him to veil his face. And, and yet uh, it says in scripture that we, we will look with unveiled faces. We have a future ahead. Uh, that, I, that is a maskless future that I look forward to. Uh, as, we, as we go about this, this um, time ahead, I think there is some wisdom in, again, living as people that are different, people that have died and have risen with our Lord, people who know that our mortality is coming. And like Moses, who had to cover his face when he was around mortal people, uh, he also, uh, as it says in Psalm 90, uh, as he prays, uh, teach me to number my days that I may gain a heart of wisdom. He, he, uh, we are to be people who, who know our day is coming, who know our numbers up, who know that that is actually written in a book uh, and held and even given to us as a, by a good, good father. Um, we can live differently, and I'm, I'm so thankful for that. Fantastic. Do you mind praying for us as we Let's end? do that. Father God, uh, these are strange and, and uh, wonderful days. Uh, you are clearly at work, and we thank you for all that you do, the hard and the good. Father, cause us to live as people different, uh, redeemed by you, uh, no longer fearful of, of the base things of this world, but redeemed and with a future that, that is clearly written by you. Father, we thank you for your son who has done all this through his death, uh, burial, and resurrection. And we look forward to his coming. Father, thank you through your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for coming back. Thank you.